Uh, honestly, this was a very refreshing exercise, and it was a way for me to challenge the way that I uh, usually come up with adventure ideas, campaign ideas, the way that I might bring together a party. In fact, for those of you who've been here for a while, you know that um, th this is definitely a, a far different approach than the one that I usually go over here on the channel in the workshop. And that's with the spreadsheet, you know, where we compare skills and, and whatnot. Not that these four characters aren't going to work together, or it's not even that they don't have skills. We could still even do that, that kind of a, a setup if we wanted. This is taking a look, though, at the story, uh, at, at the people and at the, the relationship, the give and the take, the action and reaction, cause and effect as, uh, as things happen. And remember, we're doing this from the point of view from the DM who has this knowledge. Our characters, with the presumption, or rather our players, presented us each of their individual characters. And we discussed this with them. And they said, yeah, this is the type of character I want to play. And we told the, the player, all right, got it. I'm going to go, you know, get a story together. And so now with this information, we're sitting down. And the person who's piloting Francis may not know that the extra planar being with uh, with whom he struck a deal is, is also this manifestation of this uh, spirit animal, this guidance for Moolah. But that's going to be part of the story. That could be part of the discovery. Or as Derek was talking about, if one thing happened, for instance, I don't know, let's say the being uh, is... Uh, is confronted, if not by Ulf, then by his druid mentor, right? His druid mentor finally catches on to the fact that there's this extra planar being uh, that is, it's like preying on people. Um. Special number. Thank you very much, Daly. You have a beautiful Welsh accent, might I add. And Daly, I very much appreciate the sentiment and your continued subscription. Uh, it means a lot to me that over this this long term, um, that this has offered you uh, entertainment, advice, or just a chance to to be around other people uh, with whom you can relate. <clears throat> Rosia, you're, you're Rosia. You're working on uh, mythical objects. Have fun. There's a lot of there's a lot of neat stuff you can do there. Lasaria says we're on our twenty third session and the party's about to meet them uh, because they are now hired out. Oh, I'm sorry. This is off of a prior thing. We'll be doing the capital and fortress map for my overlords called the corporation tonight at four p.m. Eastern. Then I'll be doing some world building on the inner workings of those overlords. Yes, you've you've had your own. Uh, your world is uh, Megado, if I rec if I recall correctly, Lissaria. Uh So yes, we were uh, we're making all this. So let's say that the Druid Mentor tries to take on this extra planar being, and if the extra and no matter what happens, if the Druid Mentor dies or is injured. That's going to affect Ulf, and Ulf is going to ripple through the other characters. If the Druid Mentor injures or destroys this being, this being is going to have a big ripple effect through the other characters, directly or indirectly. Doomfish, my paladin, got to sp uh, got to speak to and even hold hands with his deity tonight. Oh, hand holding! I hope you had that marked for mature, Doomfish hand holding and then I immediately attuned to an evil sentient weapon and now I can't use magic <laughs> doomfish what's going on what what happened did, did you get a little uh did you get a little greed in your eyes or or what what happened here man you went from hand holding with your deity to uh to uh attuning to to just to you know the first floozy that uh, using Derek's uh, term just recently the first floozy, evil, sentient weapon that you come across? I thought you had faith. Fun night, fun night. That's what happens when you handhold. 
<laughs> oh, Sheeps is coming in with the, the solid advice. Also, hi, Sheeps. And I'm also not following the advice because I'm having uh, another couple of these uh, chips that, oh, it's a, it's noir. This is a slow burn, my friends, and I want to feel the slow burn. Oh, you've been lurking. Well, welcome to my fantastic art. <clears throat> well, Osario, it's ghost pepper salsa in some cheese. Am I going to sell prints? I'm going to make it freely available. How about that? King says, sometimes being a paladin just means you have an overbearing girlfriend and she won't return your calls if you flirt with a demon sword or something. <laughs> By the way, I love the latest D&D session from um, from this stream. Oh, so you watched... Um, well, wait, Grim, were you there on Tuesday or did you watch the, the VOD later on? I'm glad you liked it, though. I hoped it was descriptive and compelling, even as a uh, even as an audience member. I'll have to order a salsa and uh, Donner kebab after work. Well, make sure it's spicy and uh, and Lasaria think of me as you're as you're eating something uh, delicious and spicy. That's what the chat badges are. Nice. The longer you subscribe, the spicier you get. All right. So we have our th we have three of our four characters. Our last one here, who needs a name, and so if you come up with a name uh, during this process, that's I love it. We're not doing this off of character sheets. Remember, these characters we're doing a little differently because I want to take a different approach. Running a noir, or in this case, a fantasy noir setting, isn't the same as the D and D you may be used to. <laughs> Thank you, Lasaria. <laughs> uh, generic store brand uh, diet lemon lime soda. Cheers to you, my friend. I like the little uh, the little lid flat, uh, fastener. All right. So here we have a dragon forged. A dragon forged is a new race offered in Morgrave Miscellany. And it is kind of effectively a Dragonborn Warforged. And as we're building her story, that's definitely what it uh, what it's coming from. So she's definitely like a Dex Int or Dex uh, Charisma in her uh, in her approach. She was a cadet, so she did. Uh, she was going through some military training, and the war stopped, and there wasn't suddenly a need uh, for officers or soldiers as much anymore. And so from there, well, she was kind of released out to the wild. I'm gonna pre-prompt some of this by just drawing in. I think we can two, three, four, five, six. There we go. <clears throat> Let's make some bubbles here. You want to name her Almeyer? We can name her Al Almeyer. Pioneer of Artifice is a racial trait. Uh, Aaron was a brilliant artificer, and your task is to follow in his footsteps. But to what end? You're just beginning to master your skills, and before you're done, you want to create something that will change the world. 
So here we have an NPC that was name dropped. If you want to make this in your own, you could rename Aaron, but there's Aaron. Then we also have this, uh, we have this concept of a life goal. We want to exceed our creator's vision. We have a debt. Your family lost everything in the last war. 200 gold pieces would uh, get them a stake in a new business. Now, while we were developing this character last night, this ended up being a bit of a, a touchy subject uh, because we have a debt of 200 gold, but it wasn't to her family. Her family is presumably nobles or, or whatnot. She, uh, she was sent off to join the military because, you know, she was the third in line. And you already have the heir, and you have the person who goes to the church, so you gotta have someone who's sent to, uh, sent to the military. It's just not done otherwise. Um, and in in part of this, she was raiding an enemy, like an enemy uh, town, and uh, she uh, she died in, a, in an explosion where she was actually stealing uh, from these people. Because of course, you know it. It, uh, she was trying to prove herself to her command. She's going through the cadet training. She wanted to, she wanted to prove that she was a leader, and that maybe she found something valuable that she was going to take or even claim for her family back home. And that's when the stray fireball hit, or some sort of a bomb, and so she died. But she died doing something nefarious that uh, that ended up being shameful and leaving this indelible mark on her mind uh, that she took to the grave before she was put back together by her maker, in this case, Aaron. But of course, this is, you know, NPC. We'll actually just write it here. NPC maker. Doesn't have to be named Aaron. And she knows, oh, you know, if I ever find that family, I I got to give them 200 gold. I, I got to save up 200 gold. And it's an ongoing goal to do. And even though this family may be gone, even though their their house, their their um, you know, their modest house, could be nothing more but uh, you know, some ashes uh, that have been blown on the wind. Um, be, as she was pulled back from the brink of death by artifice, this is how she died with this thought on her mind. You know, seeing the people burning alive as she was losing consciousness after being you know thrown twenty feet from the house by the force of the blast. Uh, you know, clutching the thing that was valuable, uh, at least in her perception, but then realizing, you know, what's the what's the value of a life or several? So she has a debt that is sort of programmed into her. Oh, you want to come up? You probably don't like spicy cheese, huh? Not for you. Here. Come up and say hi. You can paw at me, or you can just come up and do it. Come on. Hey. Well, suddenly there's there's sound and everything. Come on. You know you want to. See, as soon as I look away, he's going to want to jump up. Come on. This isn't difficult. All right, so I'm gonna. I'm, I'm just gonna force it. Oh, I'm gonna force it to have it. I'm just gonna look away. La la la. Nope, no cats around here. Hey, ah, uh, there we go. <clears throat> uh, but this character mapping I actually use when characters have important connections. So you you keep it more personal to the characters, uh, to just the characters and their interpersonal relationship, right, Lasaria? And, and I, I say that not because like, oh, is that what you do? It, it's not a judgment call because I don't even I don't I don't even employ this strategy at all, let alone uh, partially or fully or whatever those could quantify. Uh, I'm not sure I understand, Rosia. 
Uh, so we're a cadet. And we're a cadet who is also a smuggler or profiteer taking advantage of the war to line your pocket. So that's where um, that's where this uh, this concept of taking something from the house uh, in, before death had occurred. Uh, well, let's see. We're good with land vehicles. We have a cadet's uniform. Or maybe she still tries to wear that like she did in life. And it's either uh, like a brand new one or maybe she has a brand new one. But maybe she still has the one in which she was burnt. And it makes her... Uh, she keeps it to try and recall back to... Uh, it, she keeps it to try and recall back to her days of being alive and not a uh, robo dragonborn. Oh, is he big? No, uh, 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 no, we saw what happened last time you wanted to get in on the minis. Not this time, buddy. He's a big cat, yeah. He's 16 pounds. He's not even really fat. He's just big. <clears throat> uh, so we have this uh, pupil of conflict, which do 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 do. Your military training allows you to easily recognize. Uh, and distinguish weapons, uniforms, military strategies, and important military figures, such as notable generals, both historical and modern. So we probably have another NPC here, which would uh, which would be sort of a, a cadet, maybe someone that she went to school with, or another contact in the military as uh, like a, a drill sergeant or something. Uh, what else? Stoic and professional. I do my best to keep morale up. Uh, those destined for victory make history, and those who make history rule the world. I'm destined to be a hero and will be nothing less than that or die trying. Well, she, she took that to the grave once, and she's been given the opportunity to take it to the grave again. I never wanted to be a soldier and have no taste for fighting. Yeah, because she, uh, she was a noble, right, before then. Uh, but her family said, you know what? We have enough heirs. Uh, we got to have people of our family going out and, uh, and you know, uh, being in business, being in the clergy, being in the military. And so she was shipped off to military school. So hopefully she would never see the front lines uh, because she was going to be an officer. Like, I don't know, maybe her family, maybe her family uh, donated generously to cadet school and her name somehow got on the roster. Um. So she was, uh, but and so she acted out, right? So she was a bit of a princess on the battlefield and said, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to give orders. And while they're doing that, I'm going to go do something else. And she broke into this family's, uh, this family's house to steal the something that she thought she really liked and tragedy struck. Hmm. So what are some other prompts that we can put here? Cause we have the debt, we have the life goal, we have her NPC maker. Um, we probably have she probably has to report to someone if the NPC maker isn't around or ultimately is like the head of the program um, she probably has an NPC like a, a handler or like a, someone who can repair her uh, or the like or, or just does um, like studies her right because she's one of the brand new models she is a dragon forged. She's not just a war forged. Um, so we'll put uh, NPC like maintenance, which is probably like partial psychologist, uh, partial engineer. All right, Derek, have a great night. Thank you for being here earlier in the in the stream and, and giving us some good narration and guidance. What was the oh the item she took? Oh, Rosia, uh, Rosia, that's that's a good idea. Um, so yeah, uh, we could we could determine what would what was so valuable that she was willing to kind of like sneak away in the middle of a battle to try and retrieve. Um, let's determine that with. <laughs> Treasure.
Uh, so I will roll a I'll roll a d6. On a one, it's uh, it's this tier. Two, three is seven fifty. Four, five, twenty five hundred, and a six. It'll be a very expensive uh, art object. That's a good prompt, Rosia. I rolled a five. Ooh, this is a, a this is a two thousand five hundred gold piece. Uh, maybe this was even crafted into her body or something. So maybe she was clutching it, and it almost fused with her bones in the hellfire. That was the the bomb or the spell that went off. Uh, so let's come back here. Uh, that we're gonna roll a d ten. Three. An embroidered silk and velvet mantle set with numerous moonstones. Uh, let's see. So it's mundane. The silk probably just caught fire and uh, and burned away. So she would have almost something like um, so a mantle is is what you you know you you set on your shoulders. Not quite a cape. Um, not quite pauldrons themselves or epaulets, I should say. Um. So she has this valuable item that's been fused into her. You know, it was so important to her. Maybe her soul kind of like latched onto it. And that's what helped her to be able to come back. And so she exists in this kind of artificial body, quasi life support for the remains that she has from her old body. However, she needs she needs to carry this item that she stole shamelessly from these people. Um, and... Um, it's always a part of her and it's always a piece of guilt like her life her life was bought at the cost of this family is a way that she could look at this and have this guilt established oh it's like what hercules did to the um uh to the nemean lion um well so she didn't kill uh she didn't like kill and process it uh, but she she definitely she stole this from the family. Ah, you, uh, you should be able to to copy and paste into the chat box. Now, if it's too long, uh, it won't show up, Rosia. But if it's uh, if it's short, you should be able to to copy and paste items. Lasaria, I would say the item is definitely something that causes conflicts for all the NPCs, and something I would use as a center point for designing this map. Yeah, so um, here, let's, she is, she is linked to each of these. Now the NPC maker, Dragonborns and such, are, are made uh, almost exclusively by a dragon marked house. And so she she is a dragon born, but she does not carry a dragon mark. Um, but the the like the maintenance worker, and the uh, uh, and well especially the NPC maker is most likely dragon marked. Oh bye, oh you got some cat butt. There you go, everyone. It's an official stream. Oh, an item that made everyone uh, uh, in your party. Oh, wow. Her life goal is probably related to the debt. False heroes. Hey, thank you so much for the follow and welcome. I hope you're enjoying what we're doing. If you have any questions or comments yourself, you're welcome to offer them in chat. And if you want to lurk, hey, you can lurk. Pull up a chair. You're at a table in a game store, and we're having some fun table talk. Okay, gotcha, Rosia. Hmm. 
Hmm, what are some other aspects here? I'm stoic and professional, doing my best to keep morale up. I'm destined for victory, to, uh, for victory to make history, all those, uh, to make history rule the world. I'm, it's a very heavy destiny. Uh, she, f and whether that's programmed or whether that is the rudimentary consciousness that she took to the grave that was sort of permanently etched in her mind as it was recovered, almost like a RoboCop situation, if you're familiar with RoboCop. Uh, oh, she also has her noble family. Who probably think that she's dead. And... I mean, what would... They're not going to be able to recognize her. And I'll show you why. Is this the beautiful daughter who went off to be an officer and to pop, you know, maybe get a paper pushing job in the middle of the war? And if you see something like this going down the streets, is that your daughter that you even if you recognized her, would you claim her? All right, Rody, sleep well. Now, in Eberron, if we're if we're steeped in this lore, the the Dragon Forged have a lot of extra lore around them. Um, you know, you were created for a purpose. This purpose is a part of your essence, tied to your moment of sentience. We've we've haven't delved extremely into, you know, into the deep lore, uh, and so we're treating her as kind of like an experiment that has been kind of set out into the populace, um, in a way maybe to measure her reactions to different uh, stimuli. To see if she's stable, things like that. Um, but if if you want to create the, a noir setting in Eberron, please don't skip over the fluff, because it will only empower you. It will only empower you to create much more in-depth stories and characters and NPCs and villains. Now, I don't think that we have, uh, right now, uh, a connection for someone who would be like an NPC cadet in the military, or someone who works in, in sort of like Warforged maintenance. Um, if we wanted to come up with a link, an interesting way I can see of doing this could be the fact that Mula. Uh, with this hideaway, uh, the hideaway could have been the, the decommissioned lab that uh, that Almire was created inside of, and and so in so doing that, um, maybe if Almire doesn't really remember the process, or I don't know if she's really hurting and needs a spare part or something, uh, she might be replaced with some standard stuff. But there could be some custom things keeping her alive. You know, it's not that Warforged are a dime a dozen in Eberron, but a Dragonforged is even more rare. And so we might even just be able to go and say that... Um, well, would the maintenance person be aware then? 
Maybe no longer. Maybe the maintenance person took a couple things and fled and is, out, is working out of another workshop. But I think we can connect Elmire then through the, the need for maintenance um, and or even the maker. Uh, so I guess in this case, let's connect... Because they're not the same person, but they're working for the same company and or organization here. And then we're going to take this character up and around. There we go. This item can even play into the maintenance. Because what if the item is breaking down? And so she only has a limited amount of time left to function or to be alive. I have an old knight if you can use, probably, but it'll need to change its race, that's all. Oh, uh, what do you mean, Rosia? Now, her noble family... Her noble family isn't dragon-marked, as they're dragon-born. They probably don't have errant dragon-marks. However, noble families are often the source of discussion from newspapers. And so we can take the noble family uh, out and around. Because her family might even... Her family might even have a stake in the newspaper. Because if you do, it's better to be the production of news than to be subjected to it. And as noble families are want to be in the papers for all sorts of things, uh, if you own the newspaper or a good portion of it, they're probably not gonna report uh, they're probably not gonna report you. NPC cadet. I mean, that could lead to other bubbles of, of uh, a military base somewhere. Uh, and I, I don't want to get as far as, like, D uh, Derek was saying, yeah, you can get, like, eight or nine bubbles deep. I don't want to do that for here. Um, but I, I want to make some good, solid connections around as much as we can. Um, so we can almost attune to the fact that this item, in its own way, or her existence is almost like an aberrant dragon mark. Not that she's being hunted, but she's unique and she stands out. People are probably unsettled around her because of what she is and what she represents. Because Warforged were already kind of like, <coughs> pardon, um, you know, viewed with suspicion. And now we're actively converting people into Warforged and not just building Warforged. That can, that can cause some social stigma. And, you know, even as Robocop, Wanted to bust the criminals. Uh, there's people in his own town that, uh, you know, didn't believe in that. Old Knight, who is one of my old characters who can be her temporary repairman. An old sympathetic knight who was once a handy and crafty merchant. He developed anti-magic arrow puff. Hey, Shukan, welcome. Uh, Shukan, brand new to the lineup, Monster Menagerie 3. Monster Menagerie 3 and Storm King's Thunder are 13... Uh, for a first dibs or 22 for the full pull. I also have um, 
Tomb of Annihilation. This is the last box before I can bust into a new brick of it. And this is the first box of a opened up brick of Ravnica. MM3 is uh, 13, uh, 13 first dibs or a 22 for a full pull. So yeah, Rosia, uh, I, I like the concept. Uh, so the, the repair person, uh, the repair person, and, and in a sense, even the cadet, right? They're both a part of the military. And so th they may be connected, maybe not uh, maybe not directly connected. Uh, in fact, we can also just sort of put, uh, we'll put a little circle here that there is, um, you know, kind of like whatever, like a, a veteran organization would be that they belong to. Uh, because, you know, a lot of people just came back from the war, so clubs and social organizations like this exist. You know, in the United States, it's um, uh, the VFW, Veterans of Foreign Wars. You might uh, do the American Legion. There's a lot of other, like, support groups and social groups. Um, so we're going to put uh, uh, VLW, uh, Veterans of the Last War, as a group. Oh, yes, sir. We will do so. And so maybe they know each other through there. And I think we have a good initial map of our characters and their interaction with each other. Well, not with each other just yet. Uh, we have a good interaction um, for who they are with the outside world. And then, as Derek prompted, um, if we come through here, actually, it's going to be easier to just fill in white. we can then draw some different relationship links between the characters themselves that are inside their, you know, that are inside the boundaries of, of who they are and what they do. Right. So if we come over here and, uh, and we'll, we'll just sort of, we'll, we'll bound this off and just kind of go, woo, woo. What are their interpersonal uh, connections here? We have the world connecting around them, but how can Almire and Ulf uh, connect? How can Almire connect uh, with Moolah, with Francis? Now, we don't have to force it and say they have to have one connection each. Uh, because honestly, what if, uh, what if Almire is just so foreign, um, that she can only really connect tenuously to Ulf, let's say, but Ulf is so connected to the others that Almire comes along for the ride, <clears throat> at least initially. But we can have our, we can just put some labels here, right? Here's some simple, simple ways to connect our, our players. So let's see, between Francis and Allmire, um, they're both nobles, so they can, they can relate. Now she has some memory issues uh, due to the fact she, she was dying and was brought back in this unique situation. Um, but there's still enough of her that uh, is probably able to identify with at least some of the uh, some of the aspects here of uh, of nobility or at least being uh, uh, having a notoriety, especially because if her noble family is somehow related to the newspaper uh, by being subject matter or partial owners, this is the newspaper that Francis is employed by. And his family probably, um, if his family doesn't own it, it probably was uh, through a placement because, you know, any newspaper, it's a newspaper, wants people from this uh, Scrivener's uh, Guild to work for him here. Um, so here uh, they can they can get along along the, the, the bonds of nobility. 
I'm just going to put one, like the first obvious one that comes to mind. We can go really deep and, and we can get this, we can make this web so sticky. Now between Almire and Ulf. Uh, let's see. Well, uh, so they can, uh, they can get along with the fact that they feel like they're re they're rejected from society. And, and they've also been reborn. He was this criminal, uh, this aberrant Dragonmark, uh, Dragonmark criminal who fled after uh, a sibling was accidentally uh, uh, put into a degenerative state. Um, and, uh, and so he was reformed by this druid mentor. And so in a way here, I guess we instead of uh, nobility, we can put uh, something like reformation or rebirth. Now, Ulf, Tamula, we can take a look here. Um, the loss, or the, the loss, or the or the sickening of someone important. Uh, Mula had an NPC lover, and Ulf had a sibling. All right. Yay, Coffee Cat, along with six Coffee Cat comiclings. Welcome, welcome. Uh, so we're going to put guilt of someone close. Coffee raid. How uh, how did the uh, how the coloring of the line art go? Hey, hey Volvo. Now, between Mula and Francis, uh, well, they they have a, a bond in so much that uh, eat, the, the, this is kind of going outside because the casino is outside. But the two of them are probably they, they've probably gambled before. They're gambling buddies. And to that ex, to that end, they probably drink together and they commiserate together because gambling is their stress explosion, to use the made RPG term. I finished it, but DW wants me to wait to post until she's finished. Oh, what happened, Volvo? Is it just because of the the intensity of the picture and, and, and the sentiment to it? Gambling and commiseration. Yeah, so this is what we've been doing, uh, Coffee. Derek was on uh, to walk me through this, uh, this way of, uh, generating some story content, because we haven't done this before in the stream, and, you know, as, as much as I like presenting, as I like presenting workshop material, I don't know everything, and I, I also, I don't want to get in the habit where I guess I only preach one way to think about something. As much as I do try and be open-minded and encourage you to think freely about the things we do, um, having moments like this, where it shakes up what we normally do, I think can really make a difference. And so here, uh, what is what is Francis's connection to Ulf? Well, Francis bears a dragon mark, and Ulf bears a uh, an aberrant dragon mark. Um, that's kind of the same thing, but different. Um, the NPC cousin is sort of like the druid mentor. Uh, so it could be someone outside of family that means a lot to them. I guess that should be influence. Just gonna put influence right there and put a period. Now, Mula to Almire. So 
she's a reborn dragonborn kind of robocop because she's a dragon forged uh character uh she does have this great debt she was in the military um oh um keeping people safe this sentiment of uh uh, th this sentiment of wanting to help people uh, in, in, and to help keep them safe uh, in various ways. Uh, so we'll just put help and safety. Now, if we wanted to go and put in, you know, if one were to discover the other, and some of that would be obvious, right? Uh, if the Druid Mentor discovers the extra planar being that Francis is, consults with, that's a conflict. Although that's not necessarily a conflict with Ulf, but Ulf might get uh, might get dragged into it. But uh, but from this exercise, I, I think you get the idea, right? How you can go through it. and all this is internal. You know, we normally do the SWAT reports, uh, strengths, weaknesses, which is going to be everything in between the four characters opportunities and threats are what's on the outside of the web that's happening in the world in each of the quadrants that exist here. So this is the SWAT report that we usually make. It's reformatted and presented in a different, uh, in a different fashion. I like the relationship map method because it makes you think about the story from the character perspective and make the plot centered on them, not some outside force like most campaigns tend to be. It's different, and that's why I wanted this different approach, Coffee. When we're when we're telling a noir story, it's street level. It's uh, you know, it's something held close. Um, the story may never go out into the grand world and save the universe from a lich or a, a, a pirate invasion from the astral sea. We're talking your neighborhood is the world, and and so things uh. And, and people know your secrets because secrets are tough to keep in this sort of uh, environment. You're also not extremely powerful. You're level zero. All of these characters, all the content we got off of here are from level zero characters. They have no class levels or archetypes. This is simply racial and background material. And this is also just a first draft of a, a cursory map. Th this can get even deeper. But yeah, so we can pull... Pardon. We can pull villains. We can pull NPCs. We can generate more uh, by having this laid out in front of us. And in a style of storytelling like this, where everything is uh, intimate with its proximity and also intimate with the feelings of embarrassment or everyone has a sin. And maybe people try and look away because if you notice someone else's sins, uh, they're going to see yours. Um, and... And so it really, uh, you know, in, in a, in a area of vice or shame or secrets or debt or, uh, just, you know, actions that, that people took that they were ashamed in the past. Almeyer, cutting edge technology, best Eberron, the, the world of Eberron has to offer born out of tragedy and shame. And it's now carried with her because those were her thoughts she took to the grave before she was kind of robocopped back into being a uh, Dragonforge character. And that's something that she can never necessarily regret because it's now a part of her forever. You know, we have kind of a wisecracking uh, vault tech, uh, security operator, uh, great with traps and blueprints and stuff like that. A uh, bit, bit of wisecracker. Uh, she carries, uh, she doesn't carry a regret. It's actually festered into a resentment for her NPC lover who was injured after a childhood accident. And she loved this person so much. She stepped up, took responsibility. They lived together. Um, but now it's been so long and, you know, she, she has the job to pay for medical care and all this other stuff, but now the love has turned to resentment. And it can even be the other way around where the NPC lover was happy to, you know, to be with this person and can, you know, didn't blame her for the mistake or for the accident. Um, and now it's just, I see how this, I see how Mula tortures herself. And I know 
that she doesn't like this. And I know that I could I could even go off and do other things in life, but she won't have it because she has to feel like she has to prove and take care of, of income and take care of me. And so even though I'm the recipient of care in a relationship, I feel resentful to the person giving it to me because I almost feel like I'm trapped in a, in a well-stocked house with medical care. And so their, their miscommunication, or not even miscommunication, their lack of communication, uh, instead of water under the bridge, it's dammed underneath the bridge and the water's backed up and is stagnating all while the pressure's building. Because these two probably should break up. And it might not be the prettiest. There, there's going to be a flood downriver and it's gonna, it's, there's going to be a big washout and maybe some lethalities. Um... But it needs to happen because Mula and her lover are absolutely bitter at each other. You know, it, it's all a dance. You come home and you hope to relax, but it's the same thing every night. Mula comes home. How was your day? You know, what's going on? Uh, you know, the NPC lover's like, yeah, you know, I, I was able, uh, I, I got out of my chair and I was able to, help, you know, to, to clean the bathroom. And she's like, I, no, don't do that. And and so meanwhile, the, the lover who can do it, it was probably painful, but loved the challenge, felt maybe maybe he or she was getting stronger, uh, is kind of being like, no, 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 don't. You're, you're weak and helpless, and I'm going to take care of you. And is being talked to even incidentally, or not incidentally, like uh, unintentionally, by Moolah. And Moolah is also sick because she's like, well, I was supposed to clean it, but I didn't because I was working late. And then I got so stressed out that I went to the Prancing Mountain Casino and I, I spent some of my money and, uh, and you know, I came back late. But, you know, then, of course, the bathroom needed cleaning. And, and so there's frustration. And now something that should have been, wow, cool. Thank you. I, I was, you know, I was uh, I was glad that you did that turns into, oh, thank you. Bless your heart. But that's the bless your heart that you don't want to hear. It's great hearing you talk about this stuff because I'm writing a campaign and I really want to emphasize the subtle connections that often go unnoticed. Well, uh, Greyhound, thank you for that follow, and I'm glad that you're enjoying this. Look, when we workshop on this station, which is most of what we do, uh, although I'll say that our, our Tuesday role-playing games uh, might be taken as a workshop themselves uh, with the, the content, the things that are presented, the the philosophy that, make, uh, that, that you think about. I'm probably tooting my own horn, but uh, if any uh, coffee cat, if you're out there, you can talk that up if you'd like. Um, but when we do workshops, if we build random characters, which by the way, all these characters were, uh, were randomized, but when we build full random characters, not just level zero characters, it's not a race for stats. The difference between a 16 and an 18 strength, if you're trying to develop a character or write a narrative or plot a story, isn't really important. Who the character is, is very important. And so Greyhound, that's what you'll find here. We wanna we, we wanna we wanna be storytellers. We want things to make sense. We wanna challenge ourselves. We wanna improvise, especially if we get some weird random combination of results. We got them. Let's make it work. We can do this. Why or how would someone like this exist or a condition like this exist? Or why or how would this NPC or why would this villain want this as an outcome? What's in it for that villain? And it's, it's to make you scratch your noggin and to, to say, you know what? I dig it. Oh, Shukan. Oh, one of your players, a kobold barbarian? Yes. Uh, Shukan. It wasn't a kobold. It was a, it was a dwarf. And I think that might have been one of our first YouTube videos. Um, a lawful, evil, mountain dwarf barbarian with the noble background and position of privilege. And we made a story about uh, we made a story about him and kind of a Romeo and Juliet with another. Uh, we ended up uh, randomly rolling up noble uh, for a high elf. Uh, pardon uh, for a, a high elf, and I think she was rogue actually. There's a whole story around it. It was really compelling. One of the first things we did, and it was a super awesome delve into narrative and finding commonality and building a story out of random prompts. Exactly. I love the challenge of taking something random than working things like backstory and relationships. Yep. And in fact, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, Greyhound. Um, Shukan here sponsored two boxes of minis. And so I think I'm pretty well done with the presentation on the character map and filling it out and 
you know, looking for the interpersonal relationships and how to connect things. And again, if you want to challenge yourself, because this is going to be available on our Discord uh, probably on Monday, do what Derek prompted me. Take a stone. There's an old adage. You throw a, a stone into the ocean and it is changed forever. And that's true. What's a stone here? Now with these extra connections, what if we did the same thing? Where we take a uh, where we take a prompt, right? We if we do this, and then we do the same thing. Someone finds a body. <laughs> now, when we only had the three before Almire, uh, we were able to follow the connections and see what the ripple effect was, based on the, the on the conditions of the body what people might think or do or react uh, and, and what could happen in the world or between the character uh, or presumably the characters themselves. Now that we have this inter uh, this, you know, interactive uh, structure, you know, if we find something that the body, um, what if the body, Oh, here's this. What if the body was boom, the NPC maintenance tech. The one person who probably understood Almire the most is now dead. Now, you could choose randomly. You could say it was a family member of Francis. You could say someone, uh, uh, an employee at the casino of the Prancing Mountain was found dead. Could that affect Francis and Mula because they share that connection? All right, Lasaria. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us. And, th and uh, thank you for the host. If this person's dead, Almeyer might very well be on borrowed time. Now, she doesn't know it, but that time can be extended if they find the defunct factory that made her a couple years ago, which turned out to be this hideaway that Mula and her lover knew from a long time ago. That could actually have the spare parts that are needed to replace her as she uh, goes to break down. Right? But if you don't do that, then take a prompt... Uh, it doesn't even have to be a body. Uh, what if the prompt is a uh, a scandal? Now, for the newspaper, that seems very obvious. So let's not directly connect that with uh, with the newspaper. Uh, let's roll a scandal involving um, Oh, Donuts, thank you very much for the follow. On paper, this looks like so much, but at the same time, it's also the things I have in my head for most characters after a few sessions. Yeah, uh, Paisy, it can seem overwhelming, um, but it, it doesn't have to be at all. I love the idea of the players connecting these dots in whichever way. Yeah, it, so it makes, Greyhound, it makes for organic storytelling. It makes for, there's no wrong decision or as a DM, you don't have to feel like you have to railroad the players to get to a certain point. Because anything that happens can affect something else. In fact, let's say there's a scandal. And the scandal cuts through everything because uh, the security... Uh, th there was a case of corruption at the uh, at the security office that's th that uh, manages vaults and traps and all sorts of other stuff like that. Where not Mula the employee, but another employee was found to be uh, embezzling money. Maybe not even from clients, maybe from vault itself. But what's that going to do? That's going to have this noble family that has the security dragon mark, I think it's the Kunderix, um, might reevaluate everyone, including Mula. Mula might lose her job. Right? If it's if she's like if she does her job well enough, but she's also known to go carousing at a casino, in the face of public light. Because the casino is in is uh through a through a news reporter gonna be here in the newspaper and the casino's been affected, they're probably gonna want to cut uh people from the staff that have a public image of you know carousing. And so whatever the scandal was is going to cost Mula her job, which means that that's going to apply relationship pressure to her NPC lover and herself and may very well have her 
spend more time with Ulf, Elmire, or Francis, which could uh, which could then uh, cause more stresses or could shift around some of the bubbles in certain ways. Or this could be why, uh, you know, one of the reasons uh, that, uh, you know, there's debt between Elmire and Ulf. Francis is always in for a scoop. Mula loses her job, but she still retains her training. And so she ends up through this scandal triggering a series of events that leads our level zero street level adventurers on a campaign. And when I say campaign, you might end at level four because by level four in Eberron, you are, uh, you're a, uh, a big swing and wand. <laughs> we'll put it lightly like that. And the scandal can turn back around, and, and despite all this, maybe this extra planar being that touches three of the four people directly, well, eh, maybe indirectly, maybe never even comes up because the scandal is more of a mortal nature than an, uh, than an immortal or a supernatural one. Yeah, it could be a scandal about the, the casino rigging games. Uh, yeah, it could be that. And then the the casino's like, well, no, we, we run this, but it's uh, but if you want to if you want to still use the security, you could say the security people are the ones who uh, test the randomizers. If anything was was there, it's their fault. Meanwhile, the the, the casino could have very well been the one to uh, to rig the tables or whatever. Yeah, it uh, you could just have it be a, a rumor about a noble family. I I tried to avoid what was obvious. Uh, such as a scandal that would go to the newspaper or a noble family just to, uh, to do a quick impromptu challenge. And hello, Klepto Plays. I'm currently using this mind map because two players in my D&D are brothers, and one of them died and the other is seeking a way to bring him back to life, but has gone around, has gone a runabout way to, of doing it because now his brother will now become his sister. Oh, through like a, a, a reincarnation? So the body, the, like the life comes back, but in a different body. Uh, yeah, Francis might might end up over the course of the story, become, uh, become Mula's lover. Uh, uh, either uh, in that could even be a case where Mula is with this NPC lover, but because there's regret or because there's uh, you know, th they're living in such a state that they might as well, you know, they might as well not be in a relationship. Maybe she wants to see Francis on the side. And maybe they have been. And so Francis is kind of a, a bit of a secret because, well, I mean, if you look at it, if Mula and her lover were being honest with themselves, they're not in a relationship anymore. But for the sake of appearances, if the NPC found out that Mula was with Francis, that would cause problems. Mula knows that. And so she's and so she's secretly seeing Francis, despite not needing to be secret. And the lover probably fully understands. I get it. I can't. I probably can't function the way that Mula would ultimately like because of the accident. And yet here everyone is. The one that is being revived has a family, adopted daughter, and betrothed who now have witnessed the person they know and love be an undead female that is now a hybrid. Like a Simic hybrid or is the mechanics from the Ravnica set? So yeah, uh, here's this, and I, I'm glad that for a lot of you, this is either reinforcing what you've done for me. This is a this is a new outreach because I don't normally plot. Uh, I I do things that are similar, but I do it in more of a written way than through something that's color coded or something that is um, that is illustrated. <clears throat> As words tend to be uh, my ch uh, my uh, medium of choice than uh, than drawings. <clears throat> But think of the confidence this gives you, right? As a dungeon master, as a storyteller, as a, as a game master, if you have this relationship web in front of you, you know, behind a DM screen or just off to the side or whatever, whenever something happens in the world in which your PCs live, you can follow the ripples. You can see what would be affected and contemplate what could be the consequence for this choice. And so your world is living and breathing around the characters. And you can still prompt the story in a particular direction. And they will reach the conclusion in a natural format where there are consequences to their actions, good or bad. 
and in a noir setting, you can still find the chance for redemption, a hard fought sacrificed for redemption by doing this as well. Because you've laid everything bare. These characters are effectively just naked in bright light in front of you. There's, they may be shamed, but you, you can see everything. All their sins, all their regrets, all their opportunities, everything about them is laid out before you. And if these characters seek redemption and seek happiness, if, if they want their piece of the pie, then you have a roadmap on how they get there which includes the obstacles that they must overcome to do so. Tabaxi to human, gotcha, reincarnation. Organic, welcome, it's good to see you again. Just got done with seven hours of playing Dark Sun Converted 5th Edition. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that uh, Dark Sun. It, Dark Sun can very well be a, a noir-style setting. Uh, you know, a lot of it is street level, not very powerful. Uh, and there's definitely like an overarching sense of hopelessness or despair or abuse. Coffee. Yeah, you, you definitely, uh, you're, you definitely have the eye for the, uh, the artiste. Paisy says for me, I write, if I write something down then my mind gets locked into those ideas, for example, the correct and only answer to a puzzle, I need to keep it in my head so I can let myself be free. Ah, okay. I totally get you, Paisy. Greyhound, that's such a good point. I often forget that the NPCs that I make are living people too, and they live a life. They're not just toys to put on a shelf and the players uh, aren't around. That, yeah. Now, how much you manage, how much time you put into the NPCs or even the villain or villains, or if there's not even a villain, just a foil or an antagonist, um, that's up to you. But we can go through here and, and they have their own struggles. You know, you talk to... Um, you know, you go talk to a baker, you know, something mundane in D&D. Is it arguably even necessary if it's not a part of a quest or something? You know, but you describe uh, one of the characters really likes uh, freshly baked food and wants to go. You know, every village he goes to has to go to the bakery first thing in the morning for a loaf of bread. And you're like, OK, so a baker exists be uh, maybe because of this uh, PC who forced this NPC into, you know, realization. And, and this PC might say, you know, I walk in, what do I smell? What do I see? And, and you're generating this content. And now we have from nothing, you know, cut from whole cloth, a baker with a family who has a specialty in these like awesome pretzels. They're, they're called like morning pretzels, maybe because they have, um, they, they don't have just like an egg brushing on it, but they actually like bake an egg on top of it. Um, and so people come here for the breakfast uh, pretzels. And it's unique to this village. And suddenly you're like, breakfast pretzels? That sounds dumb, but I just created it. And everyone at the table, pardon the pun, everyone at the table's eating it up. Because your world is coming alive. And did you have to really try? Like, do you have to name, you know, his wife and six kids? Or do you just say that the baker, you know, you can hear kids playing upstairs. Uh, it's probably where the, the, the baker lives. Oh, Captain Milney brought three Captain Mil uh, Milneylings. Welcome, Cap. Welcome, welcome. So yeah, you, this this can um, th this can very well um, this this can very well make your world expand in a reasonable, organic fashion. And it helps you be a better storyteller because you're being more aware of the setting. You're being more aware that you don't just want to get the players to the castle. Yes, you got to get the players to the castle. But what happens along the way? And can you provide a clue? Or can you instill in them they're getting to the castle because they want to save the life of the baker, his wife, and six kids because of the looming war? And suddenly that lights a fire under their butts to get to the castle and talk to the war council because they just met eight innocents and a lovely thing, these breakfast pretzels that are going to be wiped from the face of the earth uh, should the invaders have their way. In fact, they're probably more compelled to get to the castle than just the meta knowledge of, okay, we got to get to the castle and talk to the war council. So, you know, it's going to happen. We're going to drag our feet and explore along the way. You know, and that can happen unconsciously or subconsciously. You don't even have to have a that guy player for that to happen. 
You know, they realize what the goal is and they expect it to manifest. And so they're going to do other things until it does because there tends to be the underlying opinion of choo choo. We're going to be railroaded. We're going to be railroaded there. So let's ride the brakes and see what's along the line. But by making the world come alive, by having consequences, by instilling morality, now they aren't being pushed by the train on the tracks. They are the engine and they are stoking the fires to get there as quick as possible because they love breakfast pretzels and they don't want to see that lovely family die at the hands of the invaders. Drunk D&D bonus Dark Souls 2 stream ended. I'm wiped. Yeah, hey, Cap. Uh, I appreciate the raid and I hope you had a lot of fun and, uh, and that D&D was, uh, was fun uh, playing uh, with diadems. Defiant Zero... Um, Defiant Zero is saying, bro, you're not Captain. Uh, well, Captain, I don't know. Do you have a response to that? Organic artist making the players put... Yeah, exactly. Skid in the game. If, you're, if your players, through their characters, feel divorced from the world, that tends to be where you get the murder hobos. The lol random murder hobos. Because there's no consequences to actions, right? I'm the hero. I can do no wrong, so whatever. I'm just going to steal, or I'm going to... I'm just going to kill everything. I'm not going to bother questioning NPCs or monsters or anything. Oh, I'm sorry, Klepto. You said uh, check your last message. Oh, so I explained D&D to my seven-year-old daughter tonight. She was blown away and wants to... Oh, yes. Awesome. And you know what, uh, Klepto? Um, there's uh, There are some uh, young folks uh, that come down to the store on Thursdays for the open D&D game. And seeing them get excited about the story and drawn in, and that you know they're the ones uh, that are uh, that are in the story, it's amazing, and it helps them socialize. It helps them read. It helps them draw. It helps them with math. Oh, there's so much that it can do, Klepto. Yeah, no, no problem, Defiant. Yeah, uh, Captain, uh, Captain raided, and so you're in Maddie Morg's territory now. <laughs> It's no problem at all, Defiant. All right, you know what? I owe two boxes of minis to be opened up uh, for Shukan, who sponsored them. Um, <laughs> drunkenly posting, that's fine. Uh, so why don't we do that? <laughs> 